I always get very nervous when I'm asking the guards to hurry up and move on. So sorry about that, James. Uh, if we can move on now to our next speaker, Sean Redmond. Sean is an adjunct professor with the University of Limerick. He's huge experience working with marginalised children and young people, yeah. and he's leading some really key research that I know you're going to find very interesting. So, Sean, again, if I can ask you please to keep your time. Thank you. Thanks so much. You're a real taskmaster there, um, Paul. Thank you. Um, today, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to outline some studies undertaken by the University of Limerick uh, relating to crime networks and children's involvement in them. Um, I'm going to outline what we found, and I'm going to outline what we're doing about it. But first of all, some proportion. There are probably about half a million young people aged between 12 and 18 living in the state. Of those, between 12 and 20,000, we think, are detected for crime every year. But the news is really good. We've really, really strong data to show that the majority of these uh, young people will grow out of crime without any intervention by the time they get to 18 or uh, early 20s. And the policy uh, implication of this is that we should take a light touch with them. That doesn't mean that we don't hold young people accountable for their behavior, but 50 or 60 years ago, we were putting hundreds of children from poor communities in reformatories. And we're not sure entirely how and why children grow out of crime or young people grow out of crime. Is it to do with maturation? Is it to do with taking on uh, high levels of social responsibilities? Is it around uh, brain development? What we also know, though, is about 1,000 young people in the state uh, are involved in much more serious crime linked to adults, and this includes drug sales. We think that these young people are responsible for about 50% of all juvenile crime, and these are the ones that we're particularly interested in. Uh, just to present the evidence base, really, for um, what, uh, um, what I'm drawing on to talk to you about this morning is <clears throat> I'm drawing on the international research studies around criminal networks and children's involvement, a growing body of Irish research that obviously the University of Limerick is contributing to now. Um, consultations on an ongoing basis with international uh, um, scientists involved in studying criminal networks, um, increasing consultations with frontline professionals and community representatives in Ireland, and um, more recently, learning from two trial sites where we're trying to intervene with children involved in crime networks in two anonymized locations, but real locations that we've called White Town and Yellow Town. We know that these 1,000 young people are much more likely to commit their crimes with adults in neighborhood-based criminal networks, and this facilitates illicit drug sales. And children will obviously be involved at the retail end of the transactions in local neighborhoods. <clears throat> As you'll hopefully see from my presentation of the evidence, in many cases, this involvement is hardly a choice. Given the time available, I'm taking a leap now to talk about what we know about criminal networks in Ireland and children's involvement. In our studies, these are our tools for examining how networks operate. These uh, network maps are built by guard or analysts. Individuals are linked together, detected for crime, whether are intelligence links or detections. These are all real places with different names to disguise their locations and real individuals with real relationships that are given code names to protect their identities. My research team interview local Garda members who know these individuals really well and, interview them, and we interview the local Garda members in depth. And by building up and corroborating stories, referencing these stories to other studies and using the international evidence, we can understand better what entices children into these networks and what keeps them there. So what do we know about criminal networks? They're rarely flat. Relationships are often not reciprocal, and in fact, many are exploitative and forced. Some individuals or groups of individuals are more important than others. They have superior knowledge, some have seniority, there's often an inner circle. Trust relationships, particularly where as a family and kinship core to uh, crime networks, trump relationships which are based solely on crime. Networks affect criminal surveillance over neighborhoods. They entice and coerce children into committing crime, and they cultivate children's ways of thinking. I'm showing now two examples pulled out from our original Greentown study, which is a real provincial town in Ireland. And our first example is A2, the leader of a criminal network with a strong family core. This individual was distant from committing offences. He created a mythology around himself and a climate of fear in Greentown. He operated a money lending operation which generated obligation uh, relationships and the, the repayment of debt. But the enforcement of these debts was carried out by middle ranking members of the, of the network, not by A2 himself. 
A2 shapes young people's behavior in the neighborhood he lives. They almost have a rever reverential view of him. And residents and network members self-govern their behavior. Understandably, they keep their heads down. Our second example is D1, who I've called an associate. And this means that he's not a family member, he's a criminal collaborator. And D1 is part of Green Ta the Greentown Network's middle management. He came from a very chaotic family circumstances and poor relationship with the authorities, unlike A2. He's involved in crime from an early age. He has older siblings involved with A2 and lives physically close to the network leader. He also gets caught a lot. This individual recruits and grooms children into the network. And it's these lower ranking adults that are of particular interest to us because they help sustain network activity at the local level. From this point, we're in a position to make a bit more sense of what's going on. We were, for instance, be able to be, were, we were, for instance, able to paint this picture in Greentown of children in closed friendship networks, befriended, cultivated, and groomed by mid-ranking young adults who, in turn, were governed by individuals higher in the pecking order. We call these relationships in the study associate relationships because they referred mainly to criminal collaborations or based loosely on friendships. We also noticed another type of relationship, which we call family, because they belong to a dom dominant family and kinship group in the neighborhood. And these higher status actors uh, got the associates to do the work and take the risks. Young people in the family group appear to be higher in the network than some associate adults, showing a clear familial hierarchy. And the relationships within the family and kinship network were much stronger and more resilient to interference than the associates. Examining these networks, helped us to really understand the multiple layers of adversities bearing down on the children who are captured in this toxicity and start thinking about what we can do about it. And I think we have to stop for a second. The consequence of all this is that punishing these children on the assumption that they have a free reign to act pro-socially or anti-socially is unfair. Punishing them is also ineffective. There are lots of arguments about why prevention in the early years and anti-poverty measures can help to reduce the chances of these situations happening in the future, and I wholeheartedly agree with these. However, the contribution of Greentown is to try and deal with what's in front of us now. Just a minute there, uh, Sean, please. Thanks. So this morning I'm going to leave you with this. It's a trial program funded by the Department of Justice with four elements delivered simultaneously that we've been developing in two non-disclosed trial sites, which we call White Town and Yellow Town. The first is an intensive family program which identifies and engages the 20 to 30 young people most embedded in a crime network in the local area. The second is a pro-social opportunities program which identifies individual pathways for each young person away from crime. The third is a community efficacy pillar which cultivates activity in the community to reclaim power. And the fourth is a network disruption pillar which identifies the groomers and disrupts their grooming behavior. The program is still in development, but early on is yielding promising results. I hope this gives you at least some sense of the work going on in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Sean.